Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today we're going to be talking about canonical criticism. We're going to be talking about secular and religious scholarship that looks at the Bible with the intent to figure out what the canon in its final form meant to the people who received that final canon form. So canonical criticism is a form of higher criticism and Previous higher criticism all focused around this intent to try to undermine the Bible, undermine who wrote the Bible and when it was written, and that kind of got old to scholarship. And so scholarship then began to understand that the canon itself was useful to those who were able to read and understand the final form of the canon, and they wanted to understand why the canon of the Bible was put together in the way that it was. What was the purpose? What was the meaning? What was it communicating to the people at that time? And out of this idea, canonical criticism was born. So the first thing we need to point out that canonical criticism is neither a secular pursuit nor it is a Christian pursuit. There are secular scholars who are canonical critics and there are biblical scholars who are canonical critics. Some main names, Walter Bergman, you look at how Walter Bergman writes, he's a Christian. But he writes in such a way as you don't understand what he himself believes because he's focusing pretty intently on the text. What does the text say? What does the author of the text believe? And how does it work together with other similar texts? And he doesn't really play his own cards and talk about what he believes because his focus is on the meaning of the text. In the same sense, Christine Hayes, if you listen to her Yale University lectures, she does kind of the same thing. She cares about the story of the text, the intent of the text. She doesn't really care about her own personal views that she's trying to push in there. That's not saying that there's not some of her own biases that surface from time to time. But the overall thrust of the idea is figuring out what the text means and what the text was supposed to communicate to the audience of the time. And that's neither a Christian pursuit nor a secular pursuit. It's neutral. As such, what secular canonical criticism gives the Christian world is a neutral third-party view. I mean, if you're ever in some sort of debate or dispute with someone and, and emotions are flaring, one of the things that people like to do is they bring in an arbitrator, someone, a third party, who preferably does not have any stake in the situation, and they're able to give a rational third-party perspective. And sometimes in Christianity, you need these. You need these outside voices, people who are not Christians, to look in at Christianity and try to sort out the differences in Christianity, what is actually biblical scholarship and what is not. And that's what canonical criticism actually does and what it brings to the text. So listening to the lectures of Christine Hayes, she treats the text with a lot of respect, and she tries to get out of the text what the text is actually advocating and she almost laughs at these people like these Calvinists who try to come to the text with these preconceived notions of who God is and she says you know the God of the Bible he changes his mind that is just a fact of the text so she's really true to the text and she's really dismissive of these outside theologies that are being imposed on the text so let's listen to how she treats the text Secondly, remember that the Bible isn't a manual of religion. It's not a book of systematic theology. It doesn't set out certain dogmas about God. And you need to be careful not to impose upon the Bible theological ideas and beliefs that arose centuries after the bulk of the Bible was written. For example, a belief in a heaven and hell as a system of reward or punishment, or the belief in a God that doesn't change his mind. The character Yahweh in the Bible changes his mind. It's just a fact of the text. If we wish to understand the Bible on its own terms and in its own context, then we have to be prepared to find ideas in it that may conflict with later theological notions that we hold dear. And don't assume you're going to agree with the Bible. Don't assume that the Bible will agree with itself. So then, coming to your paper assignments. You've been asked in, uh, in the final paper assignment to develop an interpretation of a passage. And the task of interpretation for the purposes of this class is not excavative. In other words, you're not asked to analyze sources or to account for how the text reached its final form, right? Source criticism. You're to look at the final form of the text and give a plausible reading that makes the best sense that you can out of the details, whether you like the meaning or not, whether you agree with the meaning or not. 
uh, try to argue from the evidence in the text itself. So you're going to be doing what you're probably quite accustomed to doing in an English class. You're going to study the text's language, its vocabulary, its structure, its style, all of the clues. Look at the immediate context, the larger context, the way vocabulary is used elsewhere in the Bible, similar vocabulary. Um, anything that might shed light on the passage's meaning or a character's motivation. And then you're going to weigh the evidence and present your reading. And as in an English class, you'll want to minimize any external assumptions uh, that you bring to the text, anything that's not supported by the text. And often the text will be truly ambiguous, precisely because there are gaps of information or there are hints that pull in two different directions at times. That's part of the great artistry of the biblical text. That's what makes it so interpretable. And if that happens, then you may want to present various uh, dueling interpretations, various plausible interpretations of the passage based on the evidence in the text and say, you know, these sorts of things lead, would lead one to suppose that this is going on. But on the other hand, these textual clues lead to the following, you know, uh, plausible interpretation of what's going on. So looking at the advice of Christine Hayes, it's much like Michael Heiser. He also says stuff like this. Read the Bible as if it were literature. Read the Bible as if it were fiction. What is it trying to communicate to the audience? What's the story that is being presented? And we need to treat it with the respect of that story. We can't just dismiss it out of hand in favor of our own preconceived notions of what we want to bring onto that text. The Bible is not haphazardly written. The Bible is written with intent and purpose and with a flair of advocacy. It's trying to do stuff and teach its readers something, something of importance, and we need to understand what's being said. And so when there's different biblical scholars and they come to the text and they just try to dismiss the text out of hand because it doesn't meet their theological needs, you know, they're undermining what that text is supposed to do because that text is a form of advocacy and it's teaching Israel something about truth, something that was important for the lifeblood worship of Israel. And so if the text is about the character of Yahweh and who Yahweh is and what Yahweh does and the authority of different people who are in charge of Israel, maybe it's an Abraham or a Moses type figure, we can't just dismiss that out of hand because it just doesn't meet our conceptions of God. The text often is trying to shape Israel's conceptions of God of Yahweh and teach them who the real Yahweh is. So let's listen to Michael Heiser saying something very similar to what Christine Hayes also said. One of the best things you can do is read your Bible like it's fiction. Because when you read fiction, when you read a novel, you instinctively know. Your, your brain is just triggered as soon as you open it. You instinctively know that the writer is trying to intelligently do things to you. He's using words deliberately. There are scenes that, you know, you, you, something happens in a scene and you just intuitively know, I, I, I bet this is going to come back into play somewhere. I bet I'll see this scene again. I bet I'll see that character again. I'll bet I'll hear that line again. You just know that the writer's doing something to you intelligently, deliberately, trying to move you down a certain path. Hey, that's the way you should read Acts. That's the way you should read the Gospels. It's the way you should read most of the Old Testament, you know, the, the biblical stories, because they're intelligently put together. It, it's not random. They're, they're actually trying to do something. They actually have an agenda. They actually have, have a place they want to take you mentally. So let them do it. Again, train your mind uh, to do that. Read it like it's fiction. So when you attempt to read the Bible in this fashion, in this way, where you're trying to figure out what the text is trying to communicate, what the author is trying to do to the reader, you come away with a lot of stuff that's very different than what modern Christians believe. And Michael Heiser, his big claim to fame is his push about this divine counsel idea. And this divine council is this uh, throne room in heaven presided over by God himself in which he consults with the angels in various manners. You see this throne room situation in Psalms 82. And you see it also in 1 Kings 22 and various other texts around the Bible. But he's really pushing this as a legitimate Jewish idea. This idea has been overlooked and just discounted by many modern Christians just because of what assumptions the Christians bring to the text. They don't see God as a God who would sit on a throne in a throne room and consult with various angels about planning of various events. They, they just discount those texts out of hand. The Job situation in which God is surrounded by angels and they're reporting on their activities on earth. People just don't think that ever happens and then they discount that the ancient Jews did believe that that did happen. 
So this canonical criticism approach to the Bible is really useful in picking up ideas which might have been overlooked or discounted throughout the ages. And it's really not afraid to go places where modern Christians would be afraid to go because they're just going to be discounted as heretics. You just listen to how Walter Bergerman writes about the different Psalms, and he writes about the Psalms of Lament, where Psalms actually accuse God of being negligent or shirking his duties to perform justice on earth. And we're going to listen to a clip by Christine Hayes, basically echoing the same type of ideas that Walter Bergman writes about in his Theology of the Old Testament. And this is Christine Hayes, a secular scholar, saying the same stuff. Canonical criticism. In God we glory at all times and praise your name unceasingly, yet you have rejected and disgraced us. You do not go with our armies. You let them devour us like sheep. You disperse us among the nations. You sell your people for no fortune. You set no high price on them. All this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Very different from what the prophets have been screaming. Our hearts have not gone astray, nor have our feet swerved from your path, though you cast us crushed to where the sea monster is and covered us over with deepest darkness. If we forgot the name of our God and spread forth our hands to a foreign God, God would surely search it out, for he knows the secrets of the heart. It is for your sake that we are slain all day long and that we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Rouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awaken. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face, ignoring our affliction and distress? We lie prostrate in the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise and help us. Redeem us as befits your faithfulness. So here's a psalm full of anger that contains an explicit denial of the rhetorically inflamed charges against Israel that we read in in many of the prophetic books. We have not forgotten you. We haven't been false to your covenant. Our hearts haven't gone astray. We haven't swerved from your path. Why are you behaving this way? This astonishing uh, protestation of innocence that accuses God of sleeping on the job is reminiscent of Job. In a way, the the two conflicting uh, viewpoints that we see running through a lot of this literature, one in which there is suffering, therefore there must be sin. Israel has sinned horribly. And the other, there is inexplicable suffering. We haven't done anything that would deserve this, anything at all. It really is reminiscent of Job. It seems to give us these two perspectives on Job suffering as an individual. Uh, We see that now played out on the level of the nation. One that is asserting, and what we have here is a view that is asserting God's negligence rather than Israel's guilt. So God's negligence, would you hear any modern Christian, any modern pastor use those words, use that phrase? Would they even cover this psalm? This is Psalm 44. Christine Hayes just read the psalm. Most Christians will just feel a sense of an unease just listening to the words spoken by the author of the psalm. And this is part of the Bible. This is part of the biblical message and part which Israel internalized and understood as a proper way of dealing with grief. And these were statements of God's neglect, or God shirking his duty, and calls for God to wake up and for God to act. Would modern Calvinists ever pray a prayer like this? Would they ever talk like this or think like this? This is part of Israel's core theological testament, and it's often neglected in churches just because of what it says, on the face value of what it says. And Psalm 88 is very, very similar to this. It's a very dark psalm, Psalm 44 and Psalm 88. And a lot of these psalms are these psalms of accusations against God, saying, why can't you hear me? Why don't you hear my prayers? Why don't you respond? Why don't you do something? I am dying. I am suffering. My enemies are closing in on me. Lord, wake up. Lord, do something. I don't understand what's going on. And scholars like Christine Hayes, they're not afraid to address these texts and point out the text and point out the importance of this text in the literature of ancient Israel. So we see what this canonical criticism, third point of view, is bringing to the Christianity. It's bringing us a way to reflect on the points of our religion that might cause some cognitive dissidence. It might make us feel uncomfortable. We might not know how to handle it. It might conflict with theology that we hold dearly. And without this third-party perspective, without someone looking in and trying to look at the text as it is written, we might just skip that over because of our biases 
people tend to engage in a lot of confirmation bias. And this is what a third-party neutral perspective brings. It helps flush that out and helps people remain intellectually honest. So I was in this debate once, and this guy's trying to talk about different questions he has about the Acts 15 text. And he's really insisting that he has the right view and everyone else is wrong. And so I say, yeah, okay, let's just go gr grab 10 random people from the mall and ask them their opinion about what this text is saying. Ask them some of these questions. And he said, no, that's invalid. These people aren't spiritually inclined. They don't understand the text. We need to reject them. So I said, okay, so how about we just go grab some scholars and see what they have to say about the text. And he says, no, they're all liberal. And they have all their biases. And they're not reliable either. You see what he's doing here? He's trying to eliminate any third-party perspective that might bring a neutral point of view to the text because he's afraid of what the text actually says. He wants to live in his own world in which he gets to create reality in his own mind and he has no check on that reality. He has no one to say that he's wrong and he has no one to, to undermine any of his crazy views that he just made up in his own head. He wants to live in a bubble, in, a, in an echo chamber. It's just not rational. And it's like, how do you deal with these people? They're just irrational people, and they just want to have their irrational beliefs. And they don't care what the truth is. They just don't. And they think that the truth can be spiritually inclined, and, and no one else could have it except for a special elect group of people. It's, it's, it's really weird. And we need to avoid that. We need to engage in intellectual integrity, intellectual honesty, and we need to actually use unbiased people to put checks on the limits to which we try to stretch the text of the Bible. So I encourage everyone to read non-Christians. I encourage everyone to read Bart Ehrman. I encourage everyone to read Rita Aslan. And just read Christine Hayes. Uh, take her Yale lecture courses. It's free online, free university courses about the Bible. You learn a lot about the Bible. Even if you don't agree with her underlying premises, she'll teach you a lot about what is going in the Bible and what it's saying and who's it saying it to and what's the historical context of these various stories. And she'll alert you to things that you probably did not know were in the Bible. To me, this is very refreshing because a lot of Christian pastors talk about the same old rehashed concepts and the concepts are tentatively derived from the text of the Bible. And a lot of it is just you know, bloviating. And that's what I pointed out to one person who was pretty big into R.C. Sproul. He just likes to talk to hear himself talk, and he doesn't care about what the Bible says, and he doesn't really go into what the text means. And a canonical critic, that's all they talk about. That's all they talk about is the text and what the text is supposed to mean to the community, to whom the text was directed, and it's good stuff. So the next clip I'm going to play is Christine Hayes again, and she's going to be talking about the Genesis narrative. And listen to how she treats it. And she treats it at its face value. What's the story communicating? And what's the progression of events? And what does it mean? And how does it work together? And how does it apply to God? And just listen to how she treats the text. Second of all, in this story, we see something that we'll see repeatedly in the Pentateuch. And that is that God has to punt a bit. He has to modify his plans for the first couple by barring access to the tree of life. That was not something presumably he planned to do. This is in response to, perhaps, their unforeseen disobedience. Certainly, the way the story unfolds, it's how it seems to us. So despite their newfound mortality, uh, humans are going to be a force to be reckoned with. They're unpredictable to the very God who created them. So in the Genesis story of the fall, this is exactly what is described. God did not expect Adam and Eve to fall, yet they did, and then he had to modify his plans on the fly in response to their actions. And Christine Hayes points out that this is a reoccurring theme within the Pentateuch, that God has to recalculate in light of human decisions. And you see that, of course, in the flood narrative, where God's regretting making man, and then deciding to wipe them out, and then repenting of that, and deciding to save one individual, and then restarting the earth with that one individual. And then right after that, we reach the Tower of Babel, where God sees that man has 
built himself up to this important place, and God says, oh, now nothing he wants will be withheld from him, and so we're going to go down and we're going to confuse the languages. And so God is responding to events as they occur, and God is just on the fly reacting. Again, just kind of listen to the blunt language that is used by Christine Hayes. She doesn't tap dance around the issues like Christian pastors will because they don't want to offend someone or their theological views that they bring to the text, that those are threatened. She'll just go out and say it. She'll say, God has to punt a little bit because God didn't expect these things and now he has to recalculate his activities in light of human activity. And that's just what the text says. So now we're going to preview a clip from Christine Hayes on the book of Jonah. God saw what they did, how they were turning back from their evil ways, and God renounced the punishment he had planned to bring upon them and did not carry it out. So idolatrous Nineveh believes God and humbles itself before God, hoping to arouse his mercy. And in another humorous touch, we read that even the animals are wearing sackcloth, right? They're fasting and, and crying out to God. So from the greatest to the very least, the inhabitants of Nineveh turn back from their evil ways, and God's mercy is, in fact, aroused. The Assyrians are spared, and Jonah is furious. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. This displeased Jonah greatly, and he was grieved. He prayed to the Lord, saying, O oh Lord, isn't this just what I said when I was still in my own country? That is why I fled beforehand to Tarshish, for I know that you are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, renouncing punishment. Please, Lord, take my life, for I would rather die than live. The Lord replied, Are you that deeply grieved? Jonah doesn't respond. He just leaves the city to sulk. And his complaint seems to be twofold. If you're going to punish the wicked, then just punish them. They deserve it. And if you're planning to spare them, then just spare them and don't waste my time with messages and oracles. But the stronger problem for Jonah seems to be the lack of punishment for the wicked. Jonah's indignant that the Assyrians didn't get what they so richly deserved. And didn't I say this would happen? You always forgive. You're this slow to anger, compassionate guy. You always repent. The wicked are never punished. I'm fed up with the way you do things, God. Your mercy perverts your justice. And some things ought not to be forgiven. People must be held to account for their evil actions. How can God not do justice? So again... In Jonah, just like as we read in Psalms, this is another instance of God's justice being on trial, God's acts being on trial. And this is not sort of stuff that you're going to get from modern Christianity talking like this and talking about these concepts and how they are laid out in the Bible. This clip really points out the tension between God's mercy and God's justice. A lot of people, they considered God's mercy a violation of God's justice. God would say he would do something, and then not do it because he was showing mercy to those people. And a lot of people saw that as a violation of doing what's right and the wicked getting what they deserve. This clip goes on to point out a very important point that was something that I just didn't realize before I listened to this clip. And, and once I heard it and started looking into it, yeah, it, it does seem to be true. I'm going to play that for you guys now. Nineveh appears as another Sodom, basically. It's a story that is in keeping with that older Torah tradition in which uh, it's assumed that God punishes non-Israelites or other nations for immorality, but not necessarily for idolatry. Um, you know, the, the Gentile sailors, even, who worship others are not necessarily punished. And in fact, it's said that they revere God and, and they're reluctant to throw this man overboard. Other nations are not obligated in the view of this book, um, as in the early traditions of Genesis, to accept monotheism. But they're bound by a certain basic moral law, maybe the moral law of the Noahide covenant. And it's for this that God has, has de 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 decreed punishment. When we go back and we look at the Deuteristic Code, the Levitical Code, this seems to be true. Israel did not punish foreigners for believing in their foreign gods. What Israel did was they punished foreigners who were trying to convert Israelites into foreign gods, and they'd also punish Israelites who converted to other gods, because Israel had a special covenant relationship with Yahweh, and they were supposed to be his and no other gods. It was an exclusive relationship. But the other peoples, the pagan peoples, they did not have this exclusive relationship. And so they were never punished for those crimes. And if you look at Israel's conquest of the Holy Land, 
they were able to displace those people because those people were exceedingly wicked. Those people were sacrificing their children and engaging in homosexual relationships, that sort of stuff. That's what the text says. And for that reason, the text says that God vomited out the inhabitants of the land. And then God adds to that a warning to Israel. He says, if you guys, if you guys follow those practices of the pagan peoples that we kicked out, I will vomit you out as well. Note that these people were kicked out for moral reasons, and it wasn't for idolatry, it wasn't for worshiping false gods, it was for moral crimes against humanity. So facts like this Christians have to deal with, and they have to deal with it in an intellectually honest way. And when uh, Christians come to the text of the Bible, and they think that the Bible is all about their certain theology about faith or about uh, being righteous with God, they have to take into account all these conflicting and uh, these tensions in the Old Testament text between these various stories, these people questioning God's righteousness and God's behavior, and uh, God pushing back in his own way against these people. And they have to really see the flexibility in the text with God's standards of righteousness and justice and how that interacts with his mercy. They really have to just understand the story of the Bible. Without that, if you're trying to impose some sort of systematic theology over the text, you're just really trying to cancel out the very contextual nature of how the Old Testament works. It's all about these stories, and it's all about how God acts in certain circumstances towards certain people, and it's not always in a predictable and uh, mechanical way. And sometimes there's a great deal of latitude shown by God in the text, and sometimes God operates in one thing in the exact same circumstance, and at a different time he acts in a different way. God is open to trying new things, being flexible, and God doesn't always have to respond in the exact same way. And that's the story of the Bible. So now we're going to hear briefly from Walter Brueggemann, and he's going to be talking about why we can't just abandon the Old Testament. And that's one of the biggest themes in his writings, in his ministry, and what he tries to stress about the Old Testament text. We can't just lose what it says. We can't just ignore it, and it has to be addressed. What is it that the Old Testament will not go away even when we try so hard? Or... What is it that the Old Testament must not go away because there is so much at stake with it for us? And what is it that is at stake for us in the church? The answer I give to this set of questions is that it is the God who inhabits the text that generates all these problems and possibilities. So now you see I've fulfilled the mandate of the lectureship. <laughs> it is this inhabiting God who causes the Old Testament to be so problematic with all these books on violence of God in the Old Testament. It is this inhabiting God who causes seminarians to vex over faith and criticism because this God will not accommodate our explanatory categories even though we have done our JEDP best to dispel and explain things away. It is this inhabiting God who dwells there as an embarrassment to us so that we prefer some more domesticated God that causes theologians, theologians of necessity to misread so that it comes out right, who creates such scandal that we cannot bear to read of this God in church, well, selectively. It is this inhabiting God who does not go away because it is this God who asserts as first and last, before you were here and after you are gone, I am and I will be. It is this inhabiting God who must not go away, who is indispensable for the church and for the life of the world, because it is this God who keeps the world and our pretensions open and penultimate, thus resisting lethal idolatries that come packaged as precious ideologies. So Walter Bergman, he bases all his writings off this idea that we need to treat the Bible how it is written. And I suggest everyone goes and buys a copy of his Theology of the Old Testament. And uh, you could skip the first couple chapters, which is talk about the history of critical scholarship. And you could skip the last few chapters, which 
deal with uh, his crazy social justice notions. But the middle section is all about the text of the Bible and going over various texts of what the Bible says. And that's actually really good, and he actually does a really good job expounding on the text and talking about what the text actually means in context. So today we talked about canonical criticism. We talked about treating the Bible with the face value reading. We talked about the importance of a third-party perspective, what atheists can bring to our understanding of the text, what secular scholarship can bring. And we talked about various canonical critics. We talked about Christine Hayes. Uh, she has the Yale University Lectures that everyone should check out. We talked about Walter Brueggemann, and he has his magnum opus, Theology of the Old Testament, everyone should check out. We also even quoted Michael Heiser and his uh, work on the Divine Council. He has a new book out as well, and a podcast called The Naked Bible, which is actually a really good podcast. I suggest people start listening to that. It'll enlighten people. If you have questions or comments for this podcast, you can put that on the God is Open webpage, or you can post that on our God is Open Facebook companion page, God is Open. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.